everybody, and thank you for joining us for our 2021 Open Banking and the Digital Finance Financial Services Environment eSummit Series here in Queensland. I am Leah Renwick, the East Coast State Manager at the FBAA, and I'm going to be your MC for today, you lucky people. This is our first eSummit of 2021. Just when you thought we were overdoing eSummits and we were all overdoing webinars, we're back again. Um, and this will run over today and tomorrow with beneficial content for you to take away from it. Please share your webcams today, guys, if you're available to. I know last year we didn't do a lot on the webcam sharing, but we would love to see your faces. It's been so long since we've seen so many of you. So it would be good today if we can see you. Just remember though, if you do turn your webcam on and you're on a laptop, please don't take it into the bathroom with you. Uh, there's nothing worse than what turns up on an internet stays on the internet. There is one and a half hour CPD allocated for each of the e-summits that we do here in Queensland and you will receive an email with the CPD code and survey following today's session. So tune in throughout the whole webinar to ensure your attendance is marked off and you will receive it. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for their support of the event. It has been a really tough 18 months and yet they've continued to work closely with us to ensure that we can provide you with the best education and assistance you need during this time. Please don't hesitate to also get in contact with them. Their details will be on the following flyer to today's session. FBAA members, don't forget that you will receive 10% off your membership every time you refer a new person to the FBAA. You can download the FBAA app from any of the app stores and you can easily access information, updates and upcoming webinars that you can register for. FBAA members, please remember you would have got an email a few weeks ago um, in regards to changing your password for our members area. Can you please ensure that you go online and do that? We have changed the way that the website operates and throughout those changes we do need you to go back in and reset your accounts with us. So you do go in and change your passwords in there as well. The FBAA Broker Support Program is also still available for our members. You can see in my background with us at the moment. The Broker Support Program hosts things like webinars, Call Your Broker, the digital education courses we have, some general support, a lot of mental health information and the videos that we've been doing. The agenda for today's session was on the registration sheet that you had for set up and it's also located down in the Zoom chat box. Throughout today's sessions as well, if you do want to ask any questions, can I encourage all of you to put your questions into the box and we will be reading them to each speaker as we go. We want to make this as interactive as, as we possibly can. I will get my words out this morning. Um, and it comes down to you guys and any questions that you may have for anybody as well. And the exciting news is we don't have to lecture you about using the right utensils and being We'll say is go Queensland in the sense of we've done really well to keep COVID at bay. So guys, please do keep sanitising, do keep washing your hands and do take as much of COVID as you can seriously. Um, we don't want to head into another lockdown similar to our friends down in at the moment as well. So guys, on with the show as they say, um, and to commence today's session, we'll now hear from Senator the Honourable Jane Hume with an update on open banking and the digital financial services environment and what the government is doing and planning for our future. Hello everyone, and thank you to the Finance Brokers Association of Australia for the invitation to speak to you all today. A lot has changed in the past year, but buying a home is still one of the most significant financial decisions that Australians make. And it can be daunting, and I want to recognise the role of brokers in matching borrowers to lenders, advising on loan application processes and negotiating interest rates. Australians are increasingly recognising the value of mortgage brokers to help them navigate the world of purchasing property. In 2003, mortgage brokers accounted for just 25% of total home loans. Now today, that number is 60%. Demand for services will continue, and recent Royal Commission reforms will only enhance consumer confidence in your sector. It's also inevitable that technology and innovation will play a greater role in future. And I think that it's terrific that the Finance Brokers Association of Australia has devoted today's webinar to open banking and digital financial services. As Minister for the Digital Economy, I am passionate about the benefits of open banking. 
Now it's still early days, but the consumer data right will revolutionise the way consumers, both individuals and businesses, use their data to compare prices, switch products, manage their finances and cash flow, and streamline banking product applications, including loans. I'm equally excited about what this means for the growth of Australia's fintech industry to deliver innovative data-driven solutions that improve Australians' lives, drive competition and productivity gains across the economy. Australia's journey towards the consumer data right, the framework that underpins open banking, started with the 2014 financial system inquiry, which recognised increased data sharing could improve financial services outcomes. Now, this was followed in 2015 by a competition policy review, which recommended improving individuals' access to their own data to better achieve consumer outcomes. The evidence base continued to build. In 2017, the Productivity Commission's inquiry into data availability and use proposed the creation of an economy-wide comprehensive right to enable consumers to control their data. Now, at the time, the Productivity Commission said there is enormous untapped potential in Australia's data. Everyone, including the government, agreed. In the 2017-18 budget, we announced the introduction of open banking and commissioned a review to recommend the best model for Australia. The government subsequently announced in its response to the Productivity Commission's inquiry, the creation of the consumer data right an economy-wide approach to data portability, implemented first in the banking sector and soon to be followed in the energy and telecommunications sector. The consumer data right was viewed as a game changer from the very start. While modelled in part on the open banking regime in the United Kingdom, the Australian framework was established with a founding principle of universality, which, among other things, put Australia at the fore of data sharing regimes globally. It meant that it was designed with economy-wide application at its very core. The consumer data right framework enables consumers to safely, efficiently and conveniently harness their own data and information held by Australian businesses for their direct benefit. The framework will enhance data-driven innovation and make products and services more affordable by putting downward pressure on prices as a result of increased competition and greater choice. Importantly, a fundamental design feature of the consumer data right is robust privacy and security protections, which will help build trust and confidence in the system. Now, these protections allow consumers to control what data is shared and with whom and for what purpose and when it must be deleted. Now, Open Banking launched on the 1st of July 2020. It started with the big four banks, ANZ, Commonwealth Bank, NAB and Westpac, providing access to certain consumer data. And this included data on savings accounts and credit accounts. From the 1st of November, the big four started providing access to mortgage and personal loan data, followed by lines of credit and trust accounts in February 2021. A number of businesses that help consumers to make the most of their data have become accredited data recipients, or ADRs and we expect the number to steadily increase as the rollout progresses. We are also now seeing banks also choosing to become ADRs, with Regional Australia Bank and the Commonwealth Bank of Australia becoming accredited, and more are expected to follow. The next milestone is fast approaching. Starting from the 1st of July this year, 12 months after the big four banks, the rollout of open banking in the non-major banks is set to occur. Now let me step through how the open banking process works in practice. Under the consumer data right framework, there are three main parties in open banking. First, there's the consumer, an individual or a sole trader business. Second, there's the data holder, a bank. And third, there is the accredited data recipient or ADR. Now this could be a budgeting app, for example, or a rival bank, but either way, they must meet stringent accreditation criteria, including information and security and privacy requirements. The future applications of the consumer data right are endless. A customer could direct her bank to share her data to an innovative ADR, say an app, which might be able to help her find a better deal on her financial products and services based on her individual circumstances. 
And as the consumer data right is implemented in more industry sectors beyond open banking, now that customer could eventually use the same innovative application to get a better deal from energy and telco providers and beyond. At no point does the customer need to share her banking login details or her password to do so. The customer has provided access to her data in minutes rather than in weeks, and she can share her data easily with other accredited data holders or recipients. And importantly, the customer has control of her data throughout the entire process. She can view and manage and withdraw consent for data sharing, as well as ask for her data to be deleted when she's done. In January 2020, an inquiry into the future directions for the consumer data right commenced, led by Scott Farrell. The government asked the inquiry to consider options to expand the functionality of the consumer data right. So this included how it could be expanded for consumers beyond just choosing to share their data and towards applying for and managing products, including by initiating payments. It also examined how the consumer data right could promote innovation through the creation of products and services that are mindful of the needs of vulnerable consumers. And importantly, the inquiry was asked to identify how the CDR could enhance consumer, business and economic opportunities. The inquiry came back with 100 recommendations and the government will respond to that report later this year. Providing for deeper functionality alongside the government's accelerated expansion to other sectors puts Australia at the cutting edge of digital and data-driven economy. During COVID-19, Australia vaulted forward in digital adoption for both consumers and businesses. And we now have an opportunity to keep that momentum going right across the economy. And that's why the government is investing almost $1.2 billion in Australia's future through the digital economy strategy. The digital economy strategy provides a roadmap to grow Australia's future as a leading digital economy and society by 2030. As part of the strategy, we have committed $111.3 million to strengthen and expand the consumer data right economy wide. Now we've already commenced implementation in energy and we've announced telco will be, the designated, will be designated as the next sector. To inform the sequencing and the prioritisation of an economy-wide rollout, Treasury is also undertaking a strategic assessment which will inform a roadmap for implementation. It will also expand Australia's international influence to establish an interoperable and rules-based approach to international consumer data portability and sharing frameworks. In the new area of open banking, Australian fintechs have a chance to seize on opportunity. It's an ideal time to innovate and expand as people look for new ways to manage their businesses and personal financial affairs. We have a tax and regulatory framework that supports innovation. We have the enhanced regulatory sandbox in place. We've introduced restricted authorised deposit taking institution licensing regime to reduce the barriers to entry into the banking sector. We've established the equity crowdfunding regime to expand access to finance for startups and early stage businesses. And we've established the UK Australia FinTech Bridge, and that's our intention to negotiate a new bridge under our digital trade agreement with Singapore. And we're not stopping there. We'll continue to look for exciting opportunities and to encourage and support startups and industry to support, to, to support Australia's economic recovery and spur it on. So, I'd like to thank the Finance Brokers Association of Australia for hosting today's webinar. The Morrison government believes that data is critical to building a modern digital economy and to delivering better outcomes for all Australians. Open banking and the consumer data right is just getting started. We understand the idea of letting money work for us with investments, but imagine if we could do the same thing with data, where consumers let their data work to their advantage and consumers trust that their, data, that their data won't be misused. So this is what the future of the consumer data right could look like as it expands. Thank you. It's a very quick ending to uh, the Honourable Jane Hume sitting there today with us. Um, and what a fantastic session we just had with her as well. So guys, I'd like to welcome Kerry Sainsbury from Credit Pick Solutions, who'll be outlining how credit payment impacts the from getting appropriate applications approved by online lenders. Kerry, that is an absolute mouthful of a title that you've got that got happening there this morning with a lot of A's in it. 
Um, but good morning, welcome to you. We always love a, a good early morning kickoff and uh, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, FBAA, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you said, my question is how credit impact, sorry, how credit impairment impacts the process flow and getting appropriate applications approved by online lenders, which is a great, sorry, my chair keeps sliding down, which is a great, great question, I guess. Um, I get asked all the time. Um, I've been in the industry a good 20 years, getting a bit sad now, but I've been in the specialist side of the industry for a good 10 years. Um, when I worked for a specialist lender as a BDM, I was told credit, credit repair was tarnished and it didn't actually work. Um, I've been with Credit Fix Solutions now for two years and I can assure you it does work. Um, we have a success rate of 90% um, and it's a great opportunity to repair the, repair the customer's credit report um, and get them back to a mainstream customer. So a few options, I guess, to streamline the process and how we can assist you and add value back to you would be two options. So say, for example, the customer comes to you um, emotionally connected to that property, um, doesn't want to let go of that property. However, you found a default on the credit report. Now, remember, there's four credit reporting bodies as well. There's Equifax, Gillian, Experian, and then we've got Creditor Watch. So make sure we're, we're doing an extra sort of five minutes due diligence when we do get some messy sort of um, impairment on that Equifax file. Make sure we're looking at the other files as well. Um, but there's two options. So we can look, if there's that emotionally connected to that property, you can look at a specialist lender and work with them, say, within 12 months. We can remove it and work with them to get getting that rate lowered or they can wait the three to eight weeks, which is our process. And we can remove the credit impairment if that, that may be RHI, so late payments. Inquiries, we're removing a lot of buy now, pay later um, inquiries under errors and loopholes, um, or defaults, court actions and judgments. So it is three to eight weeks, which is the only catch. And it just depends how badly they want to refinance or how badly they're emotionally connected to that property. Um, a lot of brokers, will come to me and mention what a great service we have done and I guess realizing that um, they didn't realize that the process worked, um, how we're removing these um, defaults, court actions, late payments is on compassionate grounds and errors and loopholes in the legislation. So they are legitimate errors as well. I have a lot of questions saying this is, you know, it's still quite tarnished and how does this work? Even if we remove that default, um, it can actually go back to that same lender because we're legitimately removing those errors and loopholes because of an error. So it's amazing how quickly um, the provider will default the customer and they're not aware, especially utility providers, even, you know, $2 million mortgage defaults we've received and it's not legitimately supposed to go on that credit report. So it's all le legitimate. Um, the fee is five grand. So a default under, sorry, a default under five grand is $1,500. We do payment plans as well. Um, the issue with that, I guess, when you're explaining it to your customer is just that um, they might think $1,500 is expensive. Remember though, we're, we're changing their, their finance life from a 7% down to a 3%. So potentially we're saving, say, 10 to 15,000 per year. So lots of benefits um, to use us. We don't charge anything up front. We're no win, no fee. So if in, if in doubt, you've got a credit report there that doesn't look right, even if it's just a couple of late payments, send it to me. We can health check it and we can go from there, um, at least use us as a first option, um, potentially to save them a lot of interest. Thanks, Leah. Awesome session, Kerry, that and sharp and uh, quick, which is what we always like as well. So guys, if anybody does have any questions, as we said at the beginning of today's session, if you pop them down into the question box, we can ask them for you. Um, Kerry, the main question I wanna ask at the moment, are you seeing an increase of inquiries still coming off the back of COVID? What was that? Sorry, it cut out. Are you still seeing an increase of inquiries coming off the back of COVID? Increase in inquiries? Yep. Late payments or inquiries as such? Uh, people with defaults, are you seeing a lot of it still come through? Yeah, in particular business defaults now because of COVID, because we've got JobKeeper, JobSinker ended in um, April and also the, a lot of the bankruptcy legislation has decreased now. It's not 
as fantastic as it was during COVID. So we're seeing a lot of um, business in trouble. The commercial legislation is a bit tougher to remove. The consumer legislation is a lot big, bigger, so we can find a lot of errors and loopholes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's unfortunate circumstances, but I guess um, all we can do is try and assist are, them as well. Are you seeing any impact people going on to hardship at all? Hardship? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Is there, is there a great deal of impact that's come from people that had applied for hardship during COVID? In terms of the late payments where they've gone onto the hardship plans with their banks. Yeah, yeah. So I know I remember presenting this ages ago saying, borrow off your dad, borrow, get savings if you're going to go into uh, financial hardship to, to go on a repayment holiday with your uh, mortgage. Because a lot of the lenders promised that this wasn't going to impact their credit report with the RHI. Unfortunately, it, it has. It does affect it. Uh, we can remove um, some of those payments as long as they were in communication with their lender um, and they had it in writing we can most likely remove it under those under those grounds so yes I think that's some great news for brokers out there as well that if your clients do have blemishes for better words that have turned up because of going on repayment holidays and things like that credit fix solutions are there to help you through that as well so if you've got any inquiries we like to keep Kerry busy um, and we like to keep Victoria and the team busy as well so make sure you do get those through to the team over at Credit Fix Solutions. So Kerry thanks for your time this morning um, I'm going to kick you off the screen because that's what we um, and I will now uh, hand over to our panel of experts who are going to be talking us through some SLAs, some loan application processes and also some new information about the products they've got. So I'm going to invite my wonderful team of presenters from Finstro, Stry Financial on deck and Lend to unmute themselves and join me this morning. And for those of you that also still don't have your cameras turned on, guys, this is a free session. We are encouraging you to turn those cameras on so we can see your smiling faces this morning and see who we're talking to. Hey, Cam. Hello, Legend. How are you? Good. You've got pants on today, I'm gathering. Uh, listen, um, a pair of boardies. I've got on. Um, just come off uh, the beach at Hastings Street on holiday just to see you. So, oh, uh, no, no, no shoes and a pair of boardies, but I was uh, good enough to put a Stry financial shirt on. It was. And look, you did warn us at the last PD day that, uh, you know, through COVID, we all did struggle with uniform. I am going to say that I am sitting here in jeans and I'm at head office. So we, we've got a much more relaxed uniform policy, I think, happening since COVID as well. And the wonderful Wonder Woman shirt. Donny, you're down there in what looks like that back wall tells me you're in your office as well. Um, so the, the work from home thing's doing well for you. We'll call home your office because you seem to spend a lot of time there. Yes, uh, correct, uh, Leah. No, love the office. Um, if I wasn't uh, here, then I wouldn't get to see the wonderful Georgia every day. So uh, I much prefer to be in the office. Otherwise, I'd spend half my day uh, talking to my cat uh, and getting easily distracted. So uh, the office is the best place for me. I think I have the same problem with mine. Many, many of us have learnt on many a webinar that mine believes that everybody that's on the webinar is talking to her. So she decides she wants to talk back to everybody on a webinar. Um, and we've got Andy Cusworth, the new kid on the block down from Finns. Welcome to your first Queensland e-summit. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're waiting for some sound from Andy. We're going to do this in sign language or braille with Andy this morning, I think, guys. Oh, and there, there's Ando giving us a gift. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> this is can you hear me okay? I can now. This is uh, what happens on the internet where everything that can go wrong will go wrong. I have my beautiful assistant, as you just saw. <laughs> <laughs> and, and look, we love that Ando's done a cameo appearance this morning. So uh, it just wouldn't be a PD day without Ando popping up somewhere. He's just pulling um, the strings in the background, don't worry. No, it's Andy Summit. We're glad to have you on board with us. Thank you. Awesome. And then we've got Starkey joining us. Mr. Ben Starkey from On Deck down in the bottom corner. Starks, good morning. Thank you for joining us, and I hope the weather's not too terrible down in Melbourne town. Yeah, good morning, Leah. Pretty cold. Um, can't say I'm in boardies and no shoes to have the, the trackies on today. Um, wish I was up there with you, Cam, but um, fortunately pretty cold here. Uh, look, mate, we're not going to say that, you know, 
Simon, and you look like you're ready for the ski fields of Mount Hotham. <laughs> That's it. And we hope lockdown's been treating you well down there, mate. You guys are having some restrictions lifted over the course of this week. So hopefully that means a little bit more freedom for you down in Victoria as well. And it's safe to the people on the call. Ben is in Victoria, but you can't catch COVID over the internet. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're quite safe. Hang on. Ben on the call with us from down there in Clowntown. I'm in Victoria. Um, <laughs> so guys, we're going to get this up and running. I guess the, the best thing that, and the best point that we're going to start with is what is it about your product that's going to set you apart from the other SME lenders or Cam, in your case, the private lenders in today's marketplace? And because Cam's on my top line and on holidays and clearly the most relaxed out of everybody, um, Cammy, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Legend. I'm always uh, pretty relaxed. Thanks so much, guys, for, um, for having me and uh, logging in this morning. Um, I guess one thing that um, sets us apart that, um, I've been banging on for a number of years um, at FBAA PD days is um, if you're going to play in the short term space, you have to be really, really careful um, simply around um, fees and charges that your clients are charged. It's not always about the interest rate and short term lending and getting your head around that is really, really important. Um, the upfront fees and charges, the establishment fees, the application fees, the valuation fees, the desktop valuation fees, um, and so on. I guess that sets us apart from everyone else in the industry. If your client doesn't get any money from us, it doesn't cost them a single cent. Um, so they can't get burnt uh, at the end of the day, where a lot of short-term lending will want um, thousands of dollars in fees up front. Usually when that happens, that person isn't the actual lender. Um, at the end of the day, we're the lender. We make money out of interest. We don't need to make money out of charging your clients um, upfront fees and charges. So that's probably the main thing that sets us apart. Perfect. Donnie, over to you and the team from Lend. What sets Lend apart as an IT-based techie platform that is going to be different than the other tech platforms that are available out there? Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks, Leah. And I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping that I understood the middle of that question because the uh, internet connection today is just marvellous. Um, look, what sets Lend Apart is we're here, like all the lenders that are on our panel, we're a solution-based tech platform. So uh, one of the big things for our brokers is it's one application form, one bank statement capture to be able to access all of the lenders on our panel. So not only does it give um, brokers who are new to commercial um, insight and an indication on where deals should be placed, but also for those guys who are already transacting commercial finance, it allows them to spend more time on their business rather than in their business to let the system do the heavy work. Now, the big thing, uh, the last thing I want to call out today is the commissions. So um, one, I'm going to start with how we make our money because that question always follows the next statement. So I'll start with that. Um, Len makes their money on volume, but we pass on 100% of our commission to the broker. So if you write a deal with Bennett on deck or with Cam at Strive, whatever you would receive if you went to them directly, you receive through the Lend platform. So 100% of comms. And I think that's such a great thing from Lend as well, that the brokers are receiving 100% of the comms that come through from those particular transactions from our brilliant team over at Lend. Um, Andy Carsworth, the man of the hour. Uh, welcome. As I said to your first one, what separates Finstro from other SMEs in today's market? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see me. We've got a few problems with a laptop, so apologies for that. But what's the support? Really, um, two big positives. So, being an ex-broker in both sides of the fence, being a broker and financier, um, two big positives is the simplicity. First one in terms of the process, all we really need from a broker is a telephone number and a name. We will then get one of the internal sales team to call them within 30 minutes and actually take over the process for them. Still their clients, still receive commissions, just make it really simple for them. We'll do the legwork for them. The second point is with our product, we're revolving line of credit. So whilst we have multiple products within our portfolio, from a broker point of view and a client point of view, it's one application, one revolving line of credit that they can use indefinitely. Just keep coming back, choose the best product for the best actual situation that the business finds its needs at the moment. And I think... 
Over to you from On Deck, Benny. Um, what separates you guys at On Deck from the rest of the SME market? Yeah, so I'd say one of us, one of our biggest um, factors that will set us apart from other short-term unsecured business lenders is is probably the unsecured part. Um, so with our product, it is we can go completely unsecured up to two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, so you won't see a hidden caveat or an all pap um, like you might with some of the other lenders above a, above a certain amount. Um, so from ten thousand up to two hundred fifty thousand will be will be totally unsecured. Um, so yeah, nothing really to worry about from a from a customer's point of view in terms of hidden hidden caveats into the contract. Um, and then another factor as well that also sets apart is probably our average loan size um, compared to some of the other uh, short term business lenders. So we can generally go up to around one hundred and fifty percent of that's probably the average, 150% of their monthly turnover um, with our average loan size sitting around 75K mark at the moment, um, sort of increased from around 50 this time last year, which is an interesting point. I think it's a great point for you guys and um, some fantastic stuff coming out of the SME market at the moment for everybody that's on today's panel and especially with the private lending side with CAM um, and the no upfront fees and things like that. It is unheard of in that private lending space. So. Um, these are the guys we want you to get in and really have a look at that can change the dynamics of how you're doing business um, today, especially with your self-employed clients. So guys, I'm going to throw some curveballs at you this morning. Um, we're going to bounce some mini scenarios off all of you, uh, test your skills, see if you know your product and whether or not you can do a particular transaction. If you can do it, um, let us know the appetite that it suits. And if you can't do it, can you let us know why you can't do it? So if I was a startup company that has been trading for six months, but has a high income of $100,000 already, what would the maximum amount I could borrow be? And what documents would you require for me to potentially get a loan with you? I'm going to mix it up and go Starkey, I'll start with you. Thanks, Alia. Um, so I'll give you a quick no. Um, so one of our main minimum requirements on deck is we need at least 12 months in business um, before we can do, can do an application. Um, in terms of the maximum amount they can borrow, if they have turned over 100K over six months, um, 200K annually, you'd generally be able to see an approval around sort of 35, 40,000, um, depending on the strength of the, the cash flow and the credit. Um, documents we'd need would just be their last six months of bank statements and application form. Um, so nice and easy there. But yeah, with this one, we need at least 12 months of business. Perfect. And I'll go over to you, Andy. Yeah, for, so for a sell, six months is fine. So that's my, our minimum time in business, just with an active ABN and GST. Um, we do 150% of turnover. So if there are, the turnover is 100,000, then we could lend them 150,000 on that. Um, in terms of documentation, bank statements, um, just the application, which we can do for them anyway, and the standard 100 point ID. And that's it. Sorry, guys, having a few IT tech issues going on at head office as well with uh, a bit of an unstable internet going on at the moment. Yep. Um, I think it's got a lot to do with, you know, Brisbane having one case of COVID. <laughs> did, did you catch that, guys, or did it drop out? No, we definitely got that one from you, Andy. Um, and I think there's some great stuff coming out of Finstro as well. So, Donny, up to lend. Now, obviously, knowing that you've got a, a brilliant platform behind it, is this something that fits the appetite of any of the lenders on the lend panel? And if so, what's the process behind doing it? Oh, look, we're all up for a shameful plug, right? So our newest lending partners at Finstro um, just answered that question for us. So, yes, that six-month minimum trade is a, is a hard one when you're looking straight for an unsecured platform, uh, an unsecured deal. One of the things that's really beneficial about the Lend platform, though, is in 12 really simple questions, we can actually identify whether it's a different product that suits the client. So is there equity in their property? Um, and so then can they go and visit CAM? Or are they a B2B business? So they're invoicing other businesses, which means that length of trade doesn't matter. If you've got invoices there um, that you can demonstrate and show, then invoice finance um, can be a really good option for clients who have been trading sort of less than six months. So again, as I mentioned, that's one benefit of the platform is by answering these really simple 12 questions, you will be connected or, demo or shown to you which lenders will consider that deal. Perfect. That's what we like to hear. We like simple. Cammy, up to you from Strive's point of view. And I know that this is going to change a little bit because it will come down to security being offered and what Strive can do. But is this something that could potentially fix 
or fit Strive's appetite if the security or the right security is sitting behind it? Yeah, most definitely, Leah. So um, obviously all of our stuff is secured typically on a second mortgage and the exit strategy is really uh, clear. Um, we're able to lend to one day um, companies, but because we're not looking at um, history or cash flow or BAS statements or bank statements for income, we're looking at security and exit strategy. So how's the client going to secure the loan? How's the client going to repay it, whether it be through a refinance or the sale of a property or outstanding invoices or whatever it is, we're more worried about the exit strategy than we are the proof of income or the trading history or anything like that. So um, definitely can look at one day PTY or TD companies. Um, so there's there's no issue there. Um, would just come down to what security the client had to offer. Perfect. Thanks, Cam. Guys, I'm just going to address a, a question that's come up over in the question box from Clint Buchanan. Clint's asked a question for those of you that can't see it. There's plenty of private lenders that charge upfront fees and still successfully settle just as there are private lenders that disappear that don't perform. Is there anything being done to identify the private lenders that are charging fees and disappearing? Um, Clint, to answer that one for you at the moment, it, the, the hard part for us is we can't have our eyes and fingers on everything for better words. Um, we do keep a close eye on the private lending market and a part of that is from the relationship we've had with Strive as well as, as the Nationwides and the Shifleys that are out there. Um, it is very difficult for us to monitor who's coming and who's going, but if you want and you can, you can always send through an email to myself or Peter um, and we can have a look and investigate things further if there is something shady going on out there. Um, we're more than happy to take to task what's happening with those particular lenders and to come to a conclusion of why they're disappearing. If they're charging fees and disappearing before a loan is settled, we have a different. So by all means, Clint, feel free to contact myself or Peter about that one directly. And we are more than happy to have a look further into it and see what we can probably uncover. And if there is problems of being in the industry as well, Companies generally don't just disappear. They may change their company names and structures. Um, that does happen a lot in the private lending market. It's something we can't deny. Um, that you probably see every two to three years, some companies do change their name and the structures of how they run. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the investors behind them as well and whether or not they've got investment money. By all means, as I said, Clint, contact me. If you've got any questions around that as well, we can always go straight out to Cameron and Cameron can give us some advice directly from the private lending side of things. Guys, moving on now, um, the next hard hitting question I have for you this morning. Bill Smith has managed a restaurant for over 15 years and has decided to go out on his own and buy his own business. He will need fixtures and fittings. Is this something that you can have a look at or is there any other type of finance that you can offer him to do this? And I will start this time with Mr. Nell over at Lend. Thank you, Leah. Look, there are de definitely options here. One of the things is that we've seen, um, and I think I spoke about this last week, is that we are seeing that true Aussie spirit. So there's lots of inquiry for startup finance um, or to purchase existing businesses. One of the things that the lenders are looking for um, in this alternate space is some sort of continuation. So yes, if you've been managing the restaurant 15 years and can clearly demonstrate that you've been active um, in the success or the running of that business, um, then getting funds to be able to buy into that business, obviously, um, it makes it a lot easier. We're also looking for um, these um, startups or business purchases that there is some sort of equity that the client can put in. So if they're looking to buy the restaurant that they've been working in and it's going to cost them 500000 then we're really looking for about a 30% uh, deposit to be able to place that deal a lot easier. Um, again, also with a business purchase, if that particular restaurant was invoicing other businesses, so had catering contracts, etc., then obviously there's the possibility to be able to access some debtor finance or invoice finance to assist with the purchase. Perfect. Great stuff, guys. I'm going to hand down to Ben over at OnDeck. Is that particular scenario of appetite for OnDeck? And if not, is there another type of finance that you might be able to offer them? Yeah, so with that one, a bit of a tricky one for us. Um, just like I touched on earlier, the 12 months in business requirement actually requires us to have the applicant or the applying customer to be a director or shareholder on the business that's applying for at least 12 months. 
um, before we can do an application. Now, there are some ways to uh, get around it. Obviously, we see all types of scenarios. Um, I actually had one last week. So um, a customer was actually hired to be a sort of the manager at the business um, sort of three years ago. And then they sort of had like a succession plan to actually take over in three years. Now, if we can prove that that customer was actually sort of responsible for the day-to-day -day running in the business for over 12 months um, by way of getting, we got that contract um, or getting pay slips. Um, then if we can show them being longer than 12 months then we can, yeah, we can have a look at it. Perfect. And Andy, over to you, is that some kind, is that a type of finance that Finstro can consider? And if not, is there another alternate finance that you might be able to offer them? Uh, no, so that's perfect for us. Um, back to what we were saying earlier, um, Leah, as long as they've been an active ABM for six months and GST registered, what we can do for them is simple credit to finance. So they send us their invoices for their fixtures and fittings, and we would pay 100% of the invoice value for them. Perfect. I love it when we get quick answers on things. So guys, I guess the, the main question is that I've got sitting behind here as well. Are there any current on offer for consumers and or brokers at the moment? Um, Cami, I'll come up to you. Sorry, mate, I missed that. You dropped out. That's okay. Are there any current specials that you have on offer for consumers and or our brokers? No, listen, we've just um, dropped our rates on our mortgage fund product. So we have a, a first mortgage product um, that's at 9.99% per annum with no fees or charges. Um, so there's no establishment fees, application fees, anything like that. So when I spoke earlier about sometimes it's not always in the rate, um, but having brokers come to us with um, uh, companies that are offering in the sixes, six and a half, six point seven, what have you, but by the time you add the fees and charges in, it ends up uh, well over the 9.99. Now, this is a product with no um, no requirements for any proof of income, uh, no BAS statements, um, nothing like that, no tax returns. Um, it's purely a security lend again. So we're doing a fair bit of stuff with developers um, in that space. Um, and then obviously the short-term stuff, there's a lot of people now um, trying to take advantage of opportunities. The market's growing quickly. Um, property prices are improving. Um, so people are either trying to solve a problem um, and we can provide the solution to that or take advantage of opportunities with business starting to come back after COVID. So um, we're seeing a lot of activity in the market at the moment. It's always great news to see that there is activity happening out there. And I think, Cam, the fear factor that I'm seeing as well from a private lending point of view doesn't seem to be the way that it was five or six years ago where private lending had such a bad name within the financial markets. And basically, as you've said in, in numerous presentations, you guys were seen as loan sharks. We're out there to slit the throat of any client that came through the door. Um, I yeah. think now, and are you seeing a lot more people are coming to the table because there is a better understanding for it and how people can use it within their businesses? Most definitely. And, and the key is it's, it's a solution cost, right? Um, and that's how it needs to be explained to businessmen and women. They then decide whether the cost of the solution is worth fixing the problem or taking advantage of the opportunity. Um, Kerry was speaking earlier, someone might be held up because of their credit report on refinancing their house, which they need to inject that money into their uh, company. We could fix that problem for them and give them a second mortgage against their house for three weeks while Kerry fixes their um, credit file and the refinance goes through. Now that's going to be a 3% solution. So if they borrow $100,000, it's going to cost them $3,000 to fix that problem while Kerry gets the um, credit file sorted out, right? So that may be a, a really viable solution for somebody. It's a 3% cost to fix the problem that the refinance is going to be pushed out three or four weeks while they fix a problem. Um, that's where we fit in and brokers and borrowers alike are starting to understand how to use it for their benefit. Um, and the more it becomes mainstream and the more brokers understand how it works and they can explain it to their customer, the customer then makes a decision on whether it's viable or not for their business. Great answer, Cam. I think you've rehearsed that one really well, but I will say Kerry's... <laughs> I made it up on the spot, mate. What are you talking about? Kerry's camera's turned off, so it's safe to say this. I don't think I'd ever trust Kerry saying through building a house call. Just going to say that what 
Ah, oh, that's you. She's back. I'm right here listening. <laughs> I don't know if I'd trust Kerry building a house for me, but I would have her there for the housewarming party, let's be honest. Um, so, guys, <laughs> I think, Cam, that was a, the, probably the best explanation I've heard of private lending and how it can benefit people benefit people's business as well. My England is great today, guys, so bear with me. I've only had one coffee. Um, Danelle, down with, <laughs> down with you at the moment. Um, anything that Len's doing that's remarkable out there in the market, Shimok and or Broker Give Back? Excellent. So, look, uh, Lend is a commercial-only uh, platform, so we don't transact any uh, consumer loans. Yes, we do deal with... Um, direct business owners, but typically the majority of our volume comes from either our affiliates or our broker partners. Again, um, you see in this space, and especially this time of year, um, there seems to be a little bit of a, a commission war. So there are VBIs, there are increased commissions, it's end of financial year, um, come to us. So we, again, pass on any of those promotions that lenders are running direct to their brokers. We also um, offer them directly to our brokers who transact on the Lend platform. From a Lend perspective, um, it's actually really exciting times um, and there's been a, a little bit of hype uh, ready for what's sort of coming next week. But as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we, we welcomed Finstro to the panel last week. We've welcomed another three or four lenders, but we're allowed, about to release um, our asset finance platform um, to brokers, which again, initially with a full quoting tool, um, unseen. Um, we've had quite a big team working on it. And this will be free for brokers to use, um, to abuse, to give feedback. One thing that we're really um, focusing on at Lend, we are really sort of considered as a startup, guys. So one of the things that are really important for us is for you brokers to use our system, be rewarded for your efforts, but also to give us feedback. We are one of those companies that listens. Um, we don't ask for it for the sake of appearing to be collaborative. Um, we actually ask because we wanna know. So we really encourage brokers to get in there, use the system, give us feedback, let us know what you wanna see in the system. Um, it's, it's almost one of our core values is to continue to innovate in combination and collaboration with our lenders and brokers alike. And Donnie, just a quick question from the, the outside of looking in sort of thing. After settlement, how long does it take for a broker to be paid? Oh, interesting. Good question. Um, it is a little bit product dependent. Um, so typically, um, you brokers receive their commission the same day the client deal settles. So with over 80% of our lenders, that's what happens. Um, we do need to, obviously, there's, there's always the um, asterisks, there's always the conditions. Um, and that really depends on the product. So certainly with debt of finance, um, that will not be paid until the client actually raises the invoice and then draws down on, on that particular product. Um, but across all of the other products, and trade finance, sorry, is probably the other one that really falls into that bucket where there may be a delay. Now that is lender dependent. Um, and it is the same rules um, as if you went to them directly because obviously they don't pay until the client draws down on the facility that they've been approved for. So 80% of your deals will be paid the same day um, and about 20% fall into that bucket of lender um, payment terms as far as the product is concerned. Perfect, brilliant. And we'll go down to my friend Andy Cuswell over at Finstro. Um, if we need to circle back to the question, let me know. But mate, is there any offers out there that Finstro has for the broker marketplace at the moment? There is. So um, the two we have at the moment, um, the first one up to 30th of June, any client uh, that draws down funds, they will receive no repayment for eight weeks. That's the first one. The second one is our new trade card. So a buy now, pay later for commercial customers. Um, so back to what I was saying earlier, our clients can actually pass this card on to their customers and they can take advantage. The client can get paid on day one, but their customers can spread the cost. And the other benefit to the businesses we've spoke to is that they have given us feedback and said, well, actually, that's a good retention tool for us. Yeah. Normally, we have no way of controlling that customer retention. Yeah. The customer orders or they don't order this way. In effect, they actually buy in because they can spread the cost of the products, but it keeps coming back. So it's actually in effect um, using it now as a marketing tool to actually promote out to their customer base as well. I'll unmute myself before I actually attempt to talk. Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> I'll unmute myself. We'll get this whole IT thing working eventually, but I will unmute myself to be able to say, Andy, I think that's some great stuff that you guys have got going about at the moment. So um, as we said, guys, if you uh, do need Andy's details, they will be available after today's webinar. Over to you, Mr. Starkey. What's on deck got for me this month? Yeah, so special wise, uh, we've been doing an end of financial year uh, promotion, so May and June. Um, so we have, we've halved the customer's origination fee, so down to down to one and a half percent from three, and then we're also passing over a commission boost to brokers. So uh, we pay five percent plus GST as well. Um, I know a lot of the other lenders won't won't pay that GST part, um, so it's five percent plus GST. Oh, sorry, Love it. added on top. Yeah. Love it. Love it when everybody gets that little bit extra. And I think it does mean a huge difference for our brokers out there. So guys, on to the next question. And look, being that it's almost end of financial year, will any and or all of you lend for ATO debt? And I will start with Andy Carsworth. Okay, so um, yes is, is the answer on that, um, really, Leah. In terms of the ATO debt, we've got a couple options there. Um, we can do it two ways. They can actually take um, cash out and literally pay off their ATO debt in one go, or we could actually assist them that if they put in an arrangement with the ATO, then maybe we can look elsewhere to ease the cash flow problems and maybe fund other invoices or purchasing stock. So rather than um, just looking at the ATO debt isolated, we can talk to them and see which is the best option to A, combat their ATO tax debt and whether that's paid in full in one go or as I said, repayments, and then see what else would help the business in terms of the cash flow. And again, whether we pay creditors or debtors, it comes back to that one revolving line of credit where they can have the flexibility to just draw down on which product suits their scenario at that given time. Perfect, and Starkey, over to on deck, will you lend for ATO debt? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we can lend for, for any sort of business use, um, ATO, be, ATO debt being fine. Um, our general rule from an underwriting point of view is um, we don't like the, the ATO debt to exceed 10% of what the annualised turnover is. Um, any, anything higher than that will generally ask for, for, for a good answer as to, to why it's gotten so high um, or like a, an accountant's letter to confirm uh, what has happened. Um, but yeah, anything under 10% uh, yeah, is fine with us. Um, and then obviously if they're on a, on a payment plan, it is, it is looked favorably as well. If they're looking, if they have been looking to bring it down, um, yeah, happy to do it. Brilliant. Donnie, up to the lend side of things. Have you got lenders on your panel at the moment that will lend for ATO debt? Yeah, look, um, and Andy and, and Ben have handled it quite well already. But again, this is one of the benefits of using this platform for your clients is that we have this criteria built into the system. So as a broker, when you're transacting a deal, if you actually answer the question around ATO debt, then we can actually make, then the system in the back end will actually present the lenders that will help you. Because as Ben mentioned, a lot of them will help with ATO debt, but it's all based on the amount of the ATO debt, either against A, their monthly revenue or B, their annual revenue. So most lenders will have a rule that the ATO debt cannot exceed 100% of their monthly sales, which to Ben's point is 10% of the annual revenue thereabouts. So um, we do ask the question around um, ATO debt in the platform and it is purely then to help again, match with the right lender so that if you've got a customer who wants to borrow 300,000 and they've got an ATO debt of a million dollars, you're not gonna be presented with lenders that actually can't help you. So um, Leah, in short, the answer is yes, but there are some rules around it, which the system takes care of for you. A long, short answer or a short, long answer, one of the two. Exactly. Awesome. Tammy, up to you. And I know that this does change differently from Strife's point of view, but would you be able to lend to pay off ATO debt using a, a, a residential or commercial security? Yeah, most definitely. So again, um, any any uh, business reason. So as long as it's company ATO debt, right? Um, it can't be personal ATO debt, but as long as it's business related um, ATO debt, yeah, most definitely we can... Um, we can get rid of that for the client. Perfect. So guys, we're going to do a raise the hand session um, for this one because there's quite a few scenarios we've got sitting behind it. So if you can raise your hand, if you can pick up this particular transaction and I will go through those that can do a deal and those that can't do a deal on it. 
But is there anybody on this particular panel that can lend for any of the following? And if so, if you can raise your hand and let us know the maximum LVR and loan amounts. So can anybody on today's panel lend? Um, <laughs> you cut out right at the important part. Is that lend for a farm? <laughs> this is lend for a hobby farm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, probably. Oh, we've got two hands. <coughs> So Cam's are, Cam's are probably, depending on the security, we get that one. Yep. Donnie, from your side of things, lending for a hobby farm, roughly what your maximum LVRs are and also what your loan amounts might be. Yeah, look, for the, cup, the, the couple, um, let's make that very clear, but there are a couple, um, you're really looking at um, rural type LVRs, so 50, 55% max um, with the lenders that we have on, on platform. There are a couple that will look at it purely based on cash flow. Um, so we have two of those. So obviously lending up to that 100, 150% of monthly turnover. Um, and then secondly, we've got a couple of private lending options depending on um, the equity in the actual real estate or the land itself. So they are hard. Um, they're not easy, but there are people that do them, yes. Perfect. And guys, do we have anybody coming away from the hobby farms that would do an income producing farm? Oh, the, oh, we've got one hand raised. Good so, work. So let me know your LVR and so what your loan amount would be. You did say income producing farm? Income producing farm. Yeah, cool. So yeah, with our assessments, we just look at their last six months of bank statements. Um, so as long as there's enough enough revenue there um, to support what they're looking for. Um, as I said, we generally approve around 120, 150% of, of what their turnover is um, per month. Um, that'll yeah, determine their serviceability and what we approve them for. Brilliant. And can lend for an Airbnb because they seem to be really popular with people at the moment. Well, we've got a cam and we've got a muted cam, which is always good when we get a muted cam. And we're still muted cam. So, Danelle, do you want to answer that before Cameron chimes in? Yeah, because cams now, I can answer for cam if you like. That'll all be all depend on the LVR of the property and blah, blah, blah. And if there's <laughs> enough LVR, he'll lend them the money. And, you know, if someone's 95% stacked on their Airbnb property. Um, but again, it's all about loan purpose, right? So it's got to be used for business purposes. So you can't lend against your Airbnb if you, you know, want to do something that's consumer related. So again, Cash flow or equity in property are um, the two main things. It doesn't really fall into invoice or trade space. Um, but yeah, there are a handful of people out there that will look at that. Cam, you can correct me um, in your... No, nah, mate, I, I was just wondering what size Strive shirt you want for next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll send you one over. <laughs> well, I'm the battle between our sponsors, guys. Trust me, it's always fairy on a good day. Um, can anybody on my current channel do a startup company that's been trading for less than 12 months? Yes. Ah, Andy Cusworth from Finstreet, come on down. Sorry, I didn't know if you could see the hand raised, but um, I guess I sound like a broken record. But again, back to what we said earlier, if they've got an active ABN GST for six months, we'll do 150% of the turnover. So give them a revolving line of credit, just the same. Yeah, perfect. Danelle? <coughs> well, I'm only going to point my finger down <laughs> anyway. So, um, yeah. There, there, there's your team right there. But yeah, there are a couple, um, Leah. Six months and under is where Finstray really stand out. Um, that six to 12, there are a couple of players in the market who will do it if you've been trading between six and 12. Um, but yeah, in the under six, Finstray are sort of the leaders in that space. Okay, coming up to you. Yeah, most definitely. Again, purely around what security they're looking at offering, but the under 12 months thing um, definitely doesn't affect us whatsoever. Perfect. And Cam, just clarifying, you will take commercial business premises as security? Yeah, listen, we can look at um, all types of security, whether it be vacant land or um, commercial property. One thing I guess um, a lot of brokers um, don't quite understand is when we say that it's got to be for business or investment purpose, um, they don't think that we can use residential property as security. The being outside the code has nothing to do with what security we use. So we can use a residential property in the client's personal name as a security, as long as the funds that they're using are going towards business purpose. So um, we quite often have people ring and say they want to borrow 50 grand to do renovations to their principal place of residence and they're going to sell it in three months time. We can't do that because the money 
is going into residential property that's owned in their personal name makes it a coded loan where that same person that wants fifty thousand dollars to purchase stock we can use that principal place of residence as security and take a second mortgage against that property and give them the fifty thousand dollars to purchase the stock so yeah it just depends what they what they're needing the money for perfect and guys i guess that's me wrapping up um from today's session um, we've got no questions that have come in yet, but if anybody does have any questions, now is the time to pop them over in the chat box for us. Uh, you've obviously got Cameron from Strive, Danelle from Lend, Andy Cusworth from Finstroke, and Ben Starkey from On Deck on board with us at the moment. Um, and they'll be here for pretty much for the rest of today's session. So if you don't get the question in now, they will be online. And if not, as we said, their details will come through on the following email from today's session. But guys, I do want to I know it's been kind of crazy now with the amount of business we're all doing going into the end of financial year. So I am wishing you all the best to make it through the next eight days um, because we all know the end of financial year, especially in the SME space, is a little cutthroat and a little bit hectic. So may the force be with all of you. If it's not the force, may there be a giant bottle of bourbon that is sitting there helping you get through. Um, so thank you for this morning. Legend, thank you so very much for having us. Go back thank on holidays, Cam, and put some pants on. Thanks, guys. So, guys, yes. I'd like to welcome Nick, who's going to be presenting to all of us today on easy, healthy habits, and it's going to be on behalf of Suncorp. So, Nicolette, good morning to you. Welcome back to our illustrious panel. Um, it is great to see you today, and it's always a pleasure to have you on board with us. Thank you so much, Leah. I love being part of your session. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, just going to pull you up on that bottle of bourbon and I will refer to it in detail. Of course, great to have a bottle of bourbon. We've got to drink that bourbon in moderation because it's never going to positively positively impact our mental health. So just a reminder on that. And today I'm going to share with you a few tips and tricks um, on how to enhance your mental health and well-being. I've got a little slideshow here, so hopefully everybody can see that. But just to remind you about our services at Assure Programs, I'm non-clinical, meaning I'm not a psychologist. My role is to spruik um, the awesome jobs that psychologists do in helping people de-stress and I think at this time of year for you guys um, as FBA advisors, FBA, FBAA advisors, members, lots of you might be losing sleep, being really stressed, drinking more bourbon than you probably should. Um, maybe some of you are having issues at home with relationships or just not feeling your happy, authentic self. We've got you covered. So we provide um, free confidential counselling for you guys, each and every member and your family members as well to reach out for support at any time. If you take a pen now and write down this number, 1-800-808-374, you can come and talk to us for free free confidential counselling. The entitlements are here. Everyone has access, being able to talk to a psych about anything that's bothering you, whether it be workplace or personal, four sessions across a 12-month period, plus wellbeing coaching. So lots of people aren't struggling at the moment, but maybe they're just not looking positively towards the future or not setting goals or not eating the right food or drinking too much alcohol. Um, whatever it is for you, you have the ability to sit down in a private environment, either on the telephone or face-to-face, and get things off your chest and get a really good pathway forward just talking to a psych. And it's my job um, at Assure to destigmatize the use of counselling. And just to let everyone know it's okay to not be okay. It's important that each of us can admit that we are vulnerable at different times. It's actually all of us. Um, also included in the entitlements is one session of legal advice um, if you guys ever need it. The beauty of the wellbeing coaching is that the cornerstone of our business actually focuses on positive psychology. So helping people set goals, um, understanding their signature strengths, um, working with individuals to um, just be their best version of themselves. And look, you don't always have to see a psychologist for that. Sometimes you can positively impact your mental health just um, through a couple of little tricks and tips that I have up here. The first one being nutrition. So 
the recommendation is two bits of fruit. So good on me. I got my two bananas here. And I know Leah also, when um, I got on earlier this morning, had her bit two bits of fruit. Those two pieces of fruit, five vegetables, snacks of grains and seeds and things like that will help you um, improve your physical health, obviously, but also your emotional and mental health too. And I think when you go to the supermarket, don't shop when you're hungry. Make sure you spend most of your time in the outskirts making wholesome nutritional choices. And that also includes, oh, see, look at her with her two bits of fruit. I'm so proud of you, Leah. Good job. When it comes to wholesome nutrition, it's also about what we're drinking and not drinking. So my reference to uh, Leah suggesting that we have a bottle of bourbon, of course you can. Absolutely you can. I don't want to be the wowser. I'm the pr proud promoter of you know good, good wholesome nutrition. But I think lots of us probably need to rein that drinking back a little bit because the Heart Foundation suggests two standard drinks a day. And just to remind you, the standard drink is actually that, right? I mean, sometimes it helps you get a better night's sleep, but in the long run, it's not that good for you. Plus, you need to have a couple of alcohol-free days in there. Steer clear from soft drinks. Steer clear from those energy drinks because they're just not that good for you. And as I'm speaking, I can actually see Cam at the corner of my eye drinking water. Last week, last week he made reference to drinking Coca-Cola. It's so important that we are well hydrated. So each and every one of us need to have water on our desk. And if you don't, that there's a call to action for everyone to try and get in a couple of litres of water every day because it actually, oh yeah, what's in there, Leah? That's what I'm interested to know. Hopefully it's not coffee. That's okay. Look, a couple of drinks of coffee, one or two alcoholic beverages at the end of the day. But as long as we're maximising the intake of water and not putting cordial in it and not putting tea in it, it will reduce you know, the possibility of getting a headache. It's just so good for our body. Exercise. Every single day, we need to do a little bit of huff and puff exercise. And it doesn't mean you have to spend your money joining the gym. It might be walking to the shops, walking to get a coffee. Um, maybe it, it includes a little bit of stretching. Maybe it includes some meditation, but each and every one of us need to do a little bit of huff and puff exercise. 30 minutes is actually the recommendation. And I know we're all time poor, we're all super busy, but you can do it at your desk. So sometimes what I like to do when my headset cord is not too tight is just stand up and I'd like everyone to stand up if you can, hands on hips. And I just want you to do a couple of squats with me while I keep talking. Okay, just a little bit of exercise, really good for the quads. I want you to squeeze your glutes. Doing things like this can absolutely assist with elevating your mood. And I think sometimes, you know, it's as simple as doing a little couple of little things. Maybe you don't need to see the psychologist if you're not sleeping, but maybe you need to just modify some of your daily habits. Thanks very much, everyone. And before I move on from the exercise, I just want to point out the importance of breathing deep diaphragmatic breathing. The psychs here at work call it box or square breathing, but it's inhaling for four. So just everyone uncross your legs, sit up straight, hands on your lap and take a deep breath in for four seconds with me like this. Hold it for four and exhale for four. Hold it for four. Inhale for four. And look, you can keep going like that while I'm talking to you. Hopefully not falling asleep either. But it's just, I think, a really good tip to remember the power of the breath. Whether or not you're meditating or engaging in mindful activity, the power of the breath helps uh, maintain clarity. Sometimes if you're stressed or about to lose your cool or you're dealing with a difficult client, if you just take a moment and breathe, there is just such a positive impact to your mental health and well-being. Connection is another item that I want to talk about. I know that it's really been difficult through COVID with that disconnection and not seeing loved ones and not seeing people um, that fill us with joy and make us happy. But I think the best thing you can do is reach out to others, organise a time to catch up, even if it is just speaking on the phone. Really good idea to try and connect in with people who drag you up rather than those that drag you down. That definitely has an impact on your mental health. Going device free. Now, now, you know what, I'm guilty of this because when I get home from work and my husband wants to tell me about his boring day and my kids are at me, what's for dinner, what's for dinner, it's easy for me to sit in my 
little green chair in the corner of my lounge room and just scroll, scroll through Instagram and see what all my mates got up to, you know, on the weekend and, you know, what cool things that they are doing. But you know what? Let's try for one night a week to put our phones away, um, just to disconnect from um, IT devices, to get back and engage with loved ones, to have a meal and look them in the eye and, you know, read their facial expressions and just put your phones away. It is so good for your mental health to get back and maybe read a book or listen to some really cool music. I mean, whatever your musical taste might be, White Snake or Billie Eilish or whatever, just actually going through my Spotify account. Being grateful, just having gratitude for things um, that are important to you. Maybe ring someone and tell them what a positive impact they've made on your life or write them a letter. One really good tip is actually just before you go to bed, just take a moment and reflect on the three things that you are grateful for. Practicing that gratitude is another great way to improve your mental health and well-being. Taking the time to reflect, a little bit of quiet time, 15, 20 minutes every day, not watching telly, not on your phone, on your socials, just taking time to breathe, maybe a little bit of that breath work that we just went through. Just reflecting is actually something else that's really good. Finding joy in things, learning to laugh. I mean, I always love these sessions because I'm in the back here laughing my head off at the things Leah says, and I love it. And I think the more time that we can find people who bring joy, the better off we all are. And then the last item there is around support. We got your back. If you're struggling, don't dig, dig your head in the sand. Things to look for. Your body will give you signs and symptoms that you are stressed or overwhelmed. For some, it's losing your temper. For some, it's drinking too much alcohol, fighting with others, feeling disconnected, withdrawing, whatever it is for you. Don't crack on alone because we've got support available. It is free. It is confidential. And it's like a huge weight being lifted off your shoulder. And you know the number there, 1800 808 374. Thank you. Nicolette, we always love you joining us, especially first thing in the morning. And um, look, I, I want to just backtrack a little bit to the huff and puff comment that you made. And I'm sitting in a, in a room at the moment with two of the team from head office being Mariah and May. And I think that they will agree with me that the stairs at the FBWA national office is enough to make anybody huff and puff. And it may not be half an hour, but walking up those stairs every day is a dead set killer. Um, That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. I don't recommend it for anybody as part of your exercise. No, but feel free to and come and see us. Um, Nicolette, it's always useful. And guys, if you are looking for an update on some of the things that Nicolette covered this morning, we have popped them up into the FBAA East Coast page. So if you do need a gentle reminder as to what those points were and, and what it means and some changes that you might need to make, even if it's just one or two changes you make a week or one or two changes you make a month, all of that can make a difference. And part of that was me planning around going, I've got my apple and, and banana here. I started that on Sunday. Um, so I have started um, my two to three pieces of fruit while I'm at work to stop me from eating, let's just say, the copious amount of uh, junk food that turns up. Um, Mariah is currently sitting across from me eating her piece of fruit at the moment. Nicolette, you'd be proud of her. I'm so I, proud. I'm so I'm proud of you girls. As well. So I'm so proud of everybody up here. But um, it's not hard to make those changes. And they're really simple changes that you can make for your entire family, not just yourself. Um, because there are a lot of people out there these days that do go for convenience food. And we, we had a personal trainer work with us a few years ago. And as brokers, I'm sure you'll all understand, when we're on the road seeing clients, the easiest thing to do for lunch is generally stop at Macca's or KFC or Hungry Jack's. And it's a convenience thing. And we stop for that convenience thing. So do something simple like pack a lunchbox with you if you know you're going to go out and see clients and pull over somewhere nice. And, and have you know a home lunch rather than stopping at the KFCs and the McDonald's and Red Roosters That's and everything. So, Good on you, Leah. Yes. Yeah, just something something um, little that you can do. Um, and sorry, I'm just trying to hand. I've just got an urgent call coming in on my at the moment. Um, and guys, look, if anybody's got any questions for Nicolette, by all means, send them through um, if, either in the chat group today. Send them through on an email to us or directly to Nicolette. We're happy to help out. And keep in mind the short program just for you guys. You can also get your family involved in it and or your staff involved in it as well. So it is so important that you do understand that we we at the FBAA, our friends at Assure and Suncorp, 
are there to support you and help you get through challenging times. So, um, guys, you know, it is huge. It is one of those really exciting things that we have ahead of us um, that we're there to support through mental health and everything as well. Um, so, Nicolette, thank you for your time this morning. We do appreciate thank it. Leah. Thank you. Not a problem. And, guys, for those on the call, sorry, I did just interrupt, so we've got an urgent call coming through. Um, we're just getting notification now down from New South Wales. Um, for anybody that was looking at travelling down to Sydney to drop in on the Better Business Summit down there, it has been postponed and we're just waiting on a date now to come through from them. Um, so our thoughts are with our dear friends down in Sydney that had some more cases of COVID. And um, we do hope that this is going to be a very short-lived moment for them going into lockdown as well. So it is a forever moving piece, but look after your health out there, people, because it is, it is an important time ahead of us. So again, if anybody has those questions for Nicolette, please let us know. Um, and we're only too happy to help out there as well. We're just gonna do a quick screen change over now. Um, and I would like to welcome Christine Green to join me on the floor. Uh, Christine is our state president for Queensland and she'll also be getting joined by our wonderful team of councillors up here. So if I can get all the Queensland council to unmute themselves and turn to join me on the floor as well. Um, also, it would be remiss of me at the moment, we actually have one of our illustrious board members sitting in the background that you guys can't see. And Steve Rasmussen has joined us in the background. So Steve, thank you for joining us today as well. Um, we do know that you're sitting in the background with your web camera off, but um, it, it's always great to have such great support. And especially for you as our members from your Queensland Council, and they all do work in different areas of the industry as well. So Chris, thanks for joining us this morning. You look very, uh, I'm gonna say warm this morning uh, because we've got some, so thanks for joining us and councillors. Thank you guys for joining us as well. And I'm gonna hand over to your team. Great, thank you, Leah. And absolutely, Leah, you are a ray of sunshine. So I think, you know, to Nicolette's point around having a little bit of fun, I think we all can do uh, by having a lot more as well. So uh, look, thanks very much for the opportunity. The purpose of this time that we're gonna to spend together really is to, um, for myself, to introduce the council. Having said that, um, the council role and my role is all voluntary. Um, we're always looking uh, at opportunities to be able to continue to support yourselves, uh, including the FBAA. And if there's anyone there that would like to get involved, please reach out to myself or even to the um, council would be great. So what I'll do is I'm gonna go around firstly introducing each councillor and then each councillor will also give them a quick, will give you a quick intro and to, to themselves, their business and uh, what they see in the local market. So firstly, Graham, sorry, I'm, I'm looking for you, Graham. I can see <laughs> you. Yes, there you are, Graham. We also uh, have Bruno. I can see Bruno there. We've got Tony. Tony, oh. where are you, Tony? Great. And David, I'm not sure David was able to get back on, but I can't see him, so um, he was having a few technical problems as well. But Graham, I'll, I'll hand over to you. If you don't mind giving a little bit of an intro and a bit of your background and what you're seeing in the market today would be great. Okay. Thanks, um, Chris. Graham Dossel, of course, I've been on the State Council for a number of years and um, prior to that I was a mortgage broker and I've been in and around the mortgage industry now since 1997 actually, so um, not as long as some of you and longer than a couple of others. Um, what I'm seeing in the industry at the moment is there, there seems to be a massive upswing in the number of um, clients that are chasing, uh, sorry, that are being declined due to uh, repayment history information, the, the comprehensive credit reporting repayment in, history information being on the credit files. In fact, uh, that's gone up to a whopping nearly 20% and um, which is now being followed quite closely by um, payday lender inquiries. That's up to around 44%, leaving the little old defaults and judgments down around 30%. So there's a, there's a lot of people out there that are hurting at the moment. There's been a lot of people that were in, um, incorrectly listed with repayment history information during COVID. If you see that, you should be able to call, talk to your uh, preferred credit repair and get that removed pretty quickly, pretty straightforward. Um, so, yeah, and, and yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot of um, reasons for declines out there that you as brokers would be seeing every single day and we're seeing it a lot and um, you should be able to get it sorted out pretty quickly. Chris. 
which I've got. Great. Uh, thanks, Graham. <laughs> also, hi, like Graham has been on council, I think, for five years. Is that right, Graham? Yeah, well, yeah, Leah's nodding. I'll take, yes, five years, yes. Uh, five years. So, uh, you know, as mentioned, these roles are voluntary. So, you know, we really appreciate your contribution and support as well. I'll hand over now to Bruno. Yeah, morning, everyone. Uh, basically, Bruno Kloss from Pearl Finance and Investments. I'm located in Ipswich, uh, where it's nice and chilly at the moment. Um, I've been on council for a number of years. Uh, also, I run my own brokerage uh, business, uh, specialising predominantly in, uh, I say, 75% of my uh, volume is in commercial related transactions, uh, and that being equipment finance and commercial loans, etc. cetera. Um, and the rest is, of course, that uh, lovely mortgage uh, area that we all love to be part of. But uh, basically um, what I'm seeing in the marketplace, um, there's a fair bit of stimulus still around with the instant write-off uh, for the 150,000, and that's been extended to next year as well for equipment finance. So people are getting on board on that. What I'm advising clients is to be wary of it as well, because in two or three years' time, they might have written off that uh, asset completely, but then they decide to sell it, and say, for example, a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment that they write off in 2021. In 2023, they might sell it for $60,000. That becomes either a capital gain or income earned. So tax is payable on that. So be wary. Uh, that's my uh, takeaway. But uh, the market is very, very uh, buoyant. The problem being is supply. Supply of um, equipment and vehicles. And also, of course, because of that, uh, financiers at the moment are taking longer than normal times for approvals and settlements. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruno. That, that's great. And we'll hand over now to Tony. Tony, you're muted. Hey, Tony, just need you to unmute. We could do Tony's session for him, Christine. So we could, uh, <laughs> we could have a lot of fun with this. We could. Keep going, Tony. Enough fun, Leah. <laughs> Sorry, Tony Lindley, excuse me, I'm at Spectrum Home Loans on the Gold Coast. Uh, we're five uh, brokers down here with a couple of administration staff as well. Um, again, thank you to all our presenters today. They gave us a wealth of information that is normally hard to find. You've got to go through internet phone calls and things like that. And great questions, Liz, which, which opened up a lot more things from those funders. And um, the private funders mentioned was words was brought up that uh, in the old days, they were shonky. I think that was something that was brought out by major companies that had saw them as opposition. Um, but now with the help of brokers, we brought them into the light of day because they are a real necessity in our industry. Um, here, we've seen a lot of growth in commercial property, um, particularly uh, people who are, are renting their own factories or offices, offices not so much, but factories to a big degree, where they, they, they found out that it's much easier to buy them with current rates and cheaper, cheaper than their rent. Uh, and another big one in the industry was, was uh, cash flow finance. A lot of people looking for variations in cash for various reasons. So uh, everything I saw today was really good. I'm sure everyone else is the same in residential property. But the, the, actually the thing I'm noticing more is um, because of what's happened with COVID, uh, the loans are a lot larger than they normally would. Uh, so that's, that's the thing that's sort of, I suppose, a positive to our business, but uh, it's also a strain on society. But uh, all in all, everything's going well. And uh, it's onwards and upwards from here. Great. Thanks very much, Tony. And, and a big thank you to the councillors that were able to attend today. We do have other, we have two other councillors, unfortunately, that, that weren't able to be here, Marie in the Gold Coast and also uh, David up in uh, beautiful Townsville. So in terms of the council and the experience, we've got a really, a really experienced council from all diversified backgrounds in terms of um, what, where they specialise. And we're very fortunate to have council from here all the way up to Townsville. Uh, on a little bit of an update now, I'm not going to steal Liz's thunder because I know Leah loves talking about the conference, so I will not say anything about the conference. But we are setting the agenda for the second half of the calendar year. Uh, look, we're looking forward to um, hosting a few other summits, most likely will be in the Gold Coast, um, also Brisbane, and if we can sneak one sneakily into the Sunshine Coast, love to get there. 
Uh, and for those that have joined us from further up north, look, we are looking at seeing how we can come together as well, particularly Townsville uh, and Cairns. So watch the space, you'll, you'll hopefully see something come out very, very shortly. Now I'm very aware of the time and we, we tend to always run out of time. So that I'll close it out from here, Leah. I'm gonna hand over to you, to you now, but thanks everyone uh, for attending today. It's, it's great. If I could say I could see you, many I have, um, but uh, we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Thanks, Leah. Thank you. <laughs> technical issues going on here. I'm sitting here going, okay, I can't unmute, I can't unmute. And I know you all love hearing the sound of uh, my voice, especially at the start of the morning. But guys, it does bring us to the end of today's session. And I'd like to thank Christine and the Queensland Council for their time today and their general market. I'd like to know information, any further information, you can contact myself or Christine for any matters directly directed to the FBWA. That was really good England again this morning. Um, so guys, that does, as I said, bring us to a close. And I hope you did get a lot out of today's data. I know that I walked away learning a few more things, as I said in the lender panel session as well, there's some products that I didn't know were available out there in the marketplace. And hopefully that information will help you with some business going forward, knowing it is a tight time for all of us going into the end of financial year. So we love our, our uh, SME lenders, especially coming into this space and with our small businesses. And before we close off the Queensland Summit today, guys, just a few quick notes. We do want to acknowledge all of our national sponsors again for their time and support. You will receive their contact details in the email following this session, should you need to get in touch with them. Secondly, you will receive a code for 1.5 hours CPD and a short survey that will follow it. I do ask if you can fill out that survey for us. The more feedback you can give us, it helps us build days like today and we'll be able to get obviously more information out to you as time progresses. There is session two tomorrow morning, but please note that it is half an hour earlier. We will be kicking off at 9.30 a.m. and finishing at 11 a.m. We do need to get enough drinking time in before the state of the origin. I, I mean, sorry, not drinking time. Nicolette said we can only have one or two drinks and a state of origin. So between every drink, have a glass of water. Um, so, you know, all of these exciting things, they're just correcting me here, guys, state of origin is not tomorrow night, it's around Sunday night. So that's a bit crap for me too. But we're just gonna get you out early because it's hump day. We'll, we'll put it down to that as well. Um, so guys, on the 15th of July at 11.30 a.m., there is our next Q&A with Whitey. And the session will be from with Matt Rogers from RBG Lawyers. Um, so this is the is on board with us and to go through a couple of the critical issues that are happening within the industry at the moment and where they can assist you going forward. On the 30th of July, the big one, the baby. You can see the shirt. Today I'm Wonder Woman. I'm Wonder Woman almost every day. If I'm not Wonder Woman, I'm Superwoman. Guys, it is the national conference and I know that we've had quite a few COVID scares over the last few weeks interstate. It is full steam ahead for us at this point. Um, we are in hope that COVID will settle down for New South Wales and Victoria. But it is business in a new world. It's happening down at SeaWorld on the Gold Coast. There are so many COVID safety plans in place for this event to go ahead. Um, so let me give you an assurance now, when I put 800 people in a room, sanitizing everybody, will be washing hands, everybody will be using utensils. Uh, we have got government COVID compliance plans in place as well that we will be sticking to. So. We are excited. It will be the largest industry event face-to-face -face of its kind. Um, and obviously we do have a lot of COVID plans in place to keep you guys protected as well as keeping the FBAA staff protected. That evening we have our Sunday heroes and villains. Um, it is optional fancy dress that evening guys. And I'm getting a notification saying my internet's become unstable again. So if I have locked up, I apologize if I haven't locked up, Get your frock on for the gala dinner. Um, being heroes and villains, it is going to be the night of all nights with usual style from my side of things. It's not just a sit down dinner uh, for those excited because we do have three of the thrill seeker rides open that evening. We will also have a lot of live entertainment that's happening around the grounds for it. And an after party that will happen as well. Um, that's happening live at Movie World on site for them. So do get registered for it. Places will run out. We are maximum for that event, targeting for 800 people for it. So we do want to see your smiling faces there enjoying that day with us as well. Um, so make sure you get along, make sure you get registered. Guys, if you have any other uh, 
videos like these, so I'm going to say videos, webinars like these, you do want to have a FBAA's YouTube channel. It is available there for you to download any of the webinars and sessions that we have done around the country over the last 18 months. So guys, from Tuesday, um, I'm off to have a rather large glass of water, Nicolette, you'll be proud of me and I will go and eat my two pieces of fruit. Um, I hope you all have a fantastic day. As we said, if you do have any questions, please direct them through to myself or the FBAA local team for Queensland. And if also you can aim them at Mariah in May and they'll make sure that we get them. Um, Clint, I'm gonna answer your question. Bacon is a fruit, right? Oh, look, I'm just gonna say yes, bacon is a fruit. Um, Nicolette will probably agree with me as long as everything's eaten in moderation.